Welcome everybody to Sacred Tales. I'm glad you all could make it today. We've got a fabulous lineup for you. Um, today we're going to have in order Jay Staley, Valerie Kimball, David Claunch, Jan Powers, and David Titus. And I want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Denton, and the Mid-America Arts Alliance for giving us the opportunity to hold this once again, especially in such a challenging time. So now, sit back and enjoy. So, Jay, take it away. Good morning, everyone. It's amazing to be here, actually, when you think about it. I have a I want to start this morning with a little disclaimer about sacred stories. I've been asked to tell sacred storytelling concerts at the festival for years and at the conference as well. <clears throat> and I found this poem by Stephen Dunn that I wanted to share this morning. It's called The Sacred. After the teacher asked if anyone had a sacred place and the students fidgeted, and shrank in their chairs, the most serious of them all said it was his car, being in it alone, his tape deck playing things he'd chosen. And the others knew the truth had been spoken and began speaking about their rooms and their hiding places. But the car kept coming up, the car in motion, music filling it, and sometimes one other person who understood the bright alder of the dashboard and how far away a car could take him from the need to speak or to answer, the key in having a key and putting it in and going. The Sacred by Stephen Dunn. It has been a, a very strange year indeed. I was thinking uh, this morning about March, I had just come home from a trip to Peru in March. I'd, gone, I'd flown into Houston about a week before lots of borders were shut and people got stuck in other countries. I was very fortunate. I was preparing to come up to Denton for the festival. I had a concert I was going to be in on, on Saturday afternoon, a couple concerts and Sunday morning, the Sacred Tales. And I heard that the Rodeo Houston had been shut down and why. And so I delayed my uh, approach to Denton for a day thinking, well, if I got up there on Saturday afternoon, I'd be okay. And I got word on Friday night that the city had shut down the, the center there, the auditorium, and the festival was over in one day. And storytelling was changed kind of uh, from that day forward. I began to see my favorite storytellers like Bill Harley and others on virtual storytelling concerts and performers as well. It's changed a lot in our world. It's kind of been absolutely amazing and sometimes very hopeless. And it reminded me of this story that I've heard. I know Janine Beekman used to tell this story a lot. And so I sent out a hey to Janine this morning. It is told that in every, in every generation, there are times when hope threatens to leave the world. In the early days when the people were threatened and they were beginning to give up hope, the Baal Shem Tov would go to a secret place in the forest and there he would light a special fire and calling on the most sacred name of God, he would say the words to a holy prayer, and in this manner, the trouble was averted and hope stayed alive in the world. A generation later, it was the Megid of Mezrich, a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, who was in charge and who was, who was in place to care for his people. And when trouble came to the people again, and they were frightened about hope leaving the world, the Megid of Mezrich went to the secret place in the forest, but he had 
forgotten how to light the fire. Still, he called out the most sacred name of God, Rabono Shel Alam. I don't know how to light the fire, but I've come to this place and I still know the words to that holy prayer. And he said those words and in that time, the trouble was averted once again and hope stayed alive. Now a generation later, it fell to Moshe Lieb of Sasoff, the rabbi, the head rabbi of the time. And Lieb went to that sacred place in the forest, but he had never learned to light the fire. And he had forgotten the words to the prayer, but he called out the most holy name of God, Ribbono Shel Alam, I'm here in the forest, in this sacred place. I've forgotten how to light the fire. I don't know the words to the prayer, but this must be enough. And indeed it was enough. And the trouble was averted and hope stayed alive. Now a generation later when the troubles returned to the people and they were afraid, it fell to Israel of Ritzan, and he sat in his home where he studied and he put his head in his hands and he called out the name, the most sacred name of God, Rabbanu Shalom, it is me, Israel of Ritzen. I, I don't know where to find the place in the forest. I don't know how to light the fire. I can't remember the words to the holy prayer, but I still remember the story and that must be enough. And it was enough. Hope stayed alive. And it is said even to this day, as long as we remember the stories, we share the stories, hope will stay alive. And I think in many ways, We've kept hope alive with our stories throughout this time of the coronavirus. And we have to remember to continue to do so. I'm always thinking about how the world changes, what's permanent and what's not permanent. I've been building labyrinths lately a lot. And sometimes I put in labyrinths and spend weeks and weeks and bricks and bricks and crushed granite and I'm pretty sure those things are going to stay. I built a labyrinth in Peru in the desert. I doubt if anyone will walk it besides me. But it's in an area where we're still finding arrowheads from 3,000, 4,000 years ago. And it may be a labyrinth that lasts longer than any I've ever built and has walked fewer times than any other. And that may be permanent. I don't know. I know even in... Um, in Chartres, in France, that labyrinth that's been in the floor for 800 years, its days, it may not feel like its days are numbered, but that labyrinth, like many of the others in the cathedrals, may one day be gone. So I'm not sure there's anything permanent. A famous itinerant spiritual teacher came to the front door of a king's palace. And the guards recognized him and they let him walk through the doors and he wandered from room to room in this big palace. Eventually, he found himself in the throne room and he looked up and there was the king on the throne and the king recognized him as well. And he said, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you want? And the, the spiritual teacher said to him, well, I was hoping maybe I could get a room for the night in this inn. And the king looked at him and said, well, sir, this is not an inn. This is my palace. This is where I live. I'm the king. The teacher looked at him and said, well, who lived in this palace before you did? And the king said, well, that, that would have been my father. He was also king. He has died. And the spiritual teacher took that information in. And then he said to the king, well, let me ask you this. Who lived in the palace before him? And the king said, well, that, that would have been my grandfather. 
he, he was also king. He too has passed. The spiritual teacher said, well, let me get this straight. This place where people come and live for a short time and then move on. Did I hear you say this is not an inn? The king just smiled. Because the fact is that this too will pass, this coronavirus, and maybe next year this time we'll be meeting somewhere together and we'll be telling our stories face to face and we'll enjoy each other's company. I know that um, we're, the board met for the festival for March and I think you're gonna get word about that later today, but um, it's gonna be a while. This is gonna take a while to pass. But in the meantime, I'm sure that we'll figure out how to take these traditions that we hold as a community and we'll continue to hold tight to those traditions just adapt to them year by year in the ways that we need to. As long as the stories are needed, then we'll be needed as well. I'm gonna take a chance here this morning. I've got a song that I wanna share with you. This is a Hayes Carl song. Uh, uh, yeah, a Hayes Carl song. And uh, at the risk of opening up the Christmas season here in October, I'm gonna sing this song. Well, we'd all had to wake up for the birth of our Lord. My folks and my brother in our 82 Ford, we'd pull in the driveway, all filled up with cars, old aunts and old uncles, oh Lord, I'd see stars. And then we run to the kitchen, you know the kids in their games play fetch with old Buster, call each other names, Aunt Betty be singing while the supper was cooking. We'd unwrap the gifts when no one was looking. Let's all gather round. Grandpa say the blessing. Aunt Jane, she fell asleep. And Mary Jane, she burned the dressing. But we've got all our friends and our families here. And I'm grateful for Christmas this year. Well, this year we're in Houston. Let's all get together. Well, I almost saw snow, man. Can you believe this weather? Who's gonna be here? Uncle Frank can't make it since grandpa died. Don't know if Nana can take it. Well, this present's a sweater. The pie don't taste right, and Dad and the TV, they're starting to fight. I wish I had a drink, or maybe a dozen. Lord, what I wouldn't give for one good-looking cousin. Well, let's all gather around. Dad, you say the blessing. Aunt Jane, she fell asleep. Mary Kay, she burned the dressing. But we've got all our friends and our families here, and I'm grateful for Christmas this year. Hey, Ma, how you doing? Yeah, I miss him too. Now nah, the Christmas lights don't make your hair look blue. The cousins ain't coming. John's overseas, and I guess my wife loves her folks more than, more than me. But the ladies from church said they might stop by and I bought you this picture. Oh, mama, don't cry. Let's play cards, watch the news channel. I love you too and thanks for the flannel. Let's all gather around. Mom, you say the blessing. Aunt Jane, she fell asleep. Mary Kay, she burned the dressing. But we've got all our friends and our families here. And I'm grateful for Christmas this year. I'm grateful 
for Christmas this year. Oh, we've got all our friends and our families here, and I'm grateful for Tejas this year. I'm grateful for Tejas this year. Thank you very much. Glad you could join me. Thank you, Jay. I think we're all really grateful for Dayaz this year. Our next storyteller is Valerie Kimball. Thank you, Peggy. Morning, everybody. In the last couple of months, I've retired. And I've been doing something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I've been working with Elizabeth Ellis on my storytelling. And we meet regularly. And she always asks, do you have any questions? Is there anything you want to work on? And recently I said to her, you know, Elizabeth, I'm kind of struggling with amen stories. And she said, oh, well, you know, the stories that you end a concert with and you tie up everything together and, you know, stories like inspirational stories, sacred stories. And I interrupted her. I kind of have a problem telling religious stories. And she said, well, certainly religious stories are sacred stories, but they don't have to be. It's what's sacred to you. And I guess I got this look on my face because she said, okay, for your homework, yeah, there's homework if you work with her. For your homework, I want you to make a list of 12 sacred stories. 12 sacred number. So, Later that afternoon, I sat down with a yellow pad and I numbered one to 12. And without even thinking about it, next to number one, I wrote a promise to a child. And then it took me a week and a half to come up with the other 11. But it helped when I looked at my list of stories. No problem. Next to beauty, I had Miss Rumpheus. Next to freedom of choice, I had Count Alaric's Lady, and on and on and on. Except there was no story next to a promise to a child. I didn't tell a story like that. I don't even know any story. And then I remembered. I grew up in New York City in the 1960s, a different time. By the time I was nine, I had a, a, a key to our house. I could go anywhere I wanted to in the neighborhood. I could go roller skating with my friends. I ran all kinds of errands for my mother. I could walk down to the public library by myself. By the time I was 11, I had a city bus pass. Now that was freedom. And when I turned 13 in the fall of eighth grade, I got picked for the school play. I was so excited. The only problem was that rehearsals were every afternoon after school. So when I told my mother that, she said, well, you know I have to pick up your brother and the other children at three o'clock. I can't come back for you. Well, it's okay, Mom. I'll take the bus home. Which bus? I'll walk up Washington Square. I'll get the 6th Avenue bus. I'll take it to 29th Street. And I'll walk across town to Lexington Avenue. Well, she said, if you are going to be late for dinner, 
you need to call me from that payphone in the school vestibule. Okay. And that was that. I had I went to play practice every afternoon. Now, if practice got out early, I would get off the bus at 29th Street and it would be a madhouse. There would be trucks and cars and people and guys unloading racks of clothes because 29th Street is the edge of the garment district. And then there would be other guys loading racks of clothes onto trucks. There would be bike messengers riding up and down, office workers. The place would be full. But after five o'clock, if play practice had gone late, the place was a ghost town on 29th Street. No people. Maybe a sprinkling of cars parked on the street. The warehouse doors would be down. The gates would be locked with padlocks. The merchandise would be out of the showroom windows. Not a soul. And you know, really, I preferred it that way. I wouldn't have to weave my way in between the, the racks of clothes and all the people. I wouldn't have to put up with the smart Alex lounging in the doorways going, hey, nice uniform, little girl. But as fall went on and the days got shorter and the shadows got longer, I took to walking on the sunny side of the street next to the curb. And those blocks from 5th to Madison, from Madison to Park, from Park to Lexington, they seemed a little longer. But when I got to Lexington Avenue and I could see the house right across the street, the light would change. I'd run across. I'd run up three steps into the vestibule and I was home. And then one day, a man came out of nowhere. He pushed in behind me. He closed the door. He got between me and the door. Now that, that little room in between, that vestibule, it had been baking in the afternoon sun. It was just stuffy. But but the smell from that man, it, it filled the room. Unwashed body, filthy clothes. I could smell spilled booze and dried urine and stale vomit. Around each of his fingernails, it was just black dirt. There was dirt running in the folds of his face from his nose to his mouth. His face was all bristly and greasy. And when I looked into his bloodshot eyes, I knew him. Oh, I, not to speak to, I, I mean, I, I had seen him around the neighborhood passed out in doorways or sitting on somebody's stoop, drinking out of a flat bottle wrapped in a brown paper sack. I'd seen him before that too. He, he used to be the handyman for the parish church that was around the corner and halfway down the, down the block. I, I'd seen him hosing down the sidewalk and washing the priest's car working in the little garden in the empty lot next to the rectory. The kids from the neighborhood that I went roller skating with who went to the parochial school, they called him by name. I couldn't remember his name. And, and I thought maybe he'd fallen off the wagon in the priest had fired him. I thought, maybe he needs money. 
The only money I had was my 10 cents emergency money for the phone. But I said, what do you want? And he said, how about a little kiss? I wanted to scream then. But who would hear me? My mother was down in the basement kitchen cooking dinner. My brother, my sister, my father, they were two flights up watching television. There were no pedestrians passing on the street at this time of day. And I didn't want to make him mad. I had my door key, but I knew I'd never make it in the house without him getting in too, and I didn't want him in there. I was out of options. So I said, if I give you a kiss, do you promise to leave? And he looked surprised and he kind of jerked his head down. So I took a step toward him. I didn't want to touch him. I didn't want him touching me, grabbing me. But he stood still like a statue. And I, I leaned toward him. I stretched up. I gave him a kiss on the cheek and I stepped back and oh, I wanted to scrub my mouth. Those, I could feel those greasy bristles on my mouth, but I didn't want to offend him. And then he got this sly look on his face and he opened his mouth. And I knew he was going to start negotiating. Oh, no, I meant a kiss on the mouth. Oh, no, you did it wrong. And I couldn't stand it. I couldn't do it again. I just said, you promised. And he dropped his eyes. And he bowed his head. And he turned and he left and he closed the door behind him. And I went over and I turned the deadbolt and I put the chain on the door. And then I got my key out and I let myself in the house and I went straight to the downstairs bathroom and I scrubbed my mouth and scrubbed my mouth with soap. I washed my face, I washed my hands and I really wanted to cry. But I knew my eyes would get red and my nose would get all stuffy. And they would ask me, what's the matter? And I, I really didn't want to talk about it. So I, I sucked up my tears. I dried my face and I went out in the hall and, and I realized I'd left my school bag in the vestibule. So I opened the door to get it and that smell, it just lingered. I grabbed the bag, I closed the door. I dropped the school bag under the hall table and I dropped my keys on top, just like I always did. I went to the staircase and I called, just like I always did. I'm home. I'm safe because that man kept his promise. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Our next teller is David Clonch. 
Good morning, everybody. I kind of want to take a deep breath after that story, Valerie. Thank you. So this is Sacred Tales. Uh, much like my contemporaries out there, I was kind of wrestling with what story should I tell? Uh, I've got a really nice story that I tell from Bhutan. I got a couple of other stories that I tell in Sacred Tales, and I've told those a lot. And um, I've got a story that I tell about my mom, and I was thinking, what story will I tell? Now, reasonable people would realize that my oldest niece is getting married on 10-10-2020, which is yesterday, and it would be an absolutely ideal time to tell a story about my mom because she wasn't a part of that because she passed away. A lot of storytellers would have realized that, but I'm a little too dense for that, I think. I don't know, but I was wondering and wondering which story am I going to tell? And uh, one of my students, I won't use his real name, but so one of my students, Jeff, uh, one morning this week, said, oh, Mr. Clarch, um, uh, you heard that uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen passed away. I said, yeah, I, I heard that Eddie died. And, and Jeff said, well, you know who else died? I said, no. He said, Joe, Joe. Joe who? He said, Joe Mama. <laughs> okay, Jeff, that was pretty funny. But I took that moment to say you probably want to know your audience a little bit because sometimes Tinder, but it was kind of funny. And I said, Jeff, I was wondering what story to tell on Sacred Tales. And you've just told me which story to tell about my mom. Can I use this story to introduce these? He laughed. He said, absolutely. So with Jeff's permission, I, I tell that. My mom, I, I can't tell you her name. Uh, I can tell you what I called her. I called her mom because it was mom. And I can tell you what everybody else called her. Everybody else called her Femi, P-H-E-M-I-E, -E, Femi, which was a shortened version of her name. But her name was one of those words that was never to be uttered aloud. She hated her name. But everybody called her Femi, and that was fine. Um uh, she was born in 1935 in Central Park, Kentucky, and I know some of my uh, listeners out there already know a whole lot about her because of where she was born. That was to die for. That was her favorite accolade she could get. Mom, did you, well, how did you like that dessert? She said, oh, that dessert was to die for. Hey, Mom, did, did you see that movie last night? Oh, yeah, David, that movie was to die for. Uh, we would often go to Nags Head on vacation, family vacations. Mom, did you see that sunset last night? She said it was to die for. The greatest accolade she could give. Now, um, mom was a, a, a real strong family person. She raised three boys, and I firmly believe that there's a special place in heaven for a woman that's raised three sons. Uh, but let me tell you, how this is how, how, how much she loved us. We were at a family reunion one time, a thing that folks from Central Kentucky do a lot, right, Elizabeth? Um, we were at a family reunion, and the adults were doing what the adults do, chat, 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 chat. The kids do what kids do. We ran around. We're seeing cousins we haven't seen very often. We're running, playing, playing tag. Well, finally, we're bored with tag. What are we going to do? My older brother saw there's a basketball goal out there. Maybe we can find a basketball. So we rummaged through, and we found a basketball. <clears throat> oh, man, it's flat. We need a pump. Oh, oh, look, right over there, there's a pump. So we got the basketball court. We got the basketball. We got a pump. But we don't have that needle valve to go from the pump to inside the basketball. So we put the stuff up. Mom, we're bored. And mom said, what? Yeah, I just had a basketball. Go play basketball. Mom, we can't play basketball. We got the ball. We got the pump. We got the goal. We don't have the little needle valve to go inside. Before I could finish, she's picked up her purse and she's in her purse, that great big mama purse. And she's rummaging, rummaging, rummaging. She pulls out a needle valve. She knew there'd be a day that her boys needed one. So we go out, <laughs> pump up the basketball, we play basketball. That's the kind of mama I had. Well, <clears throat> my family has a, a, another tradition that's not so much fun. We, um, a lot of our family suffers with the disease of alcoholism. And my father uh, is an alcoholic. He's in recovery now. I'll tell you that part of the story right now. Um, and there were some times that it was really, really tough. We were really living in Upper East Tennessee and times were really tough. 
And, uh, and we were sitting around and mom, dad was off doing his thing. And we were wondering how we're going to, you know, make the bills and how we're going to feed ourselves. And mom, uh, mom was a housewife. She did an amazing job running the household, but she didn't have any real immediately marketable skills. She couldn't just go out and get a job. So she was thinking, what will we do? And she had an idea. We could get a paper route. Mom, a paper route? Well, she said, I've already done the investigation. I've already know there's a paper route out there that we could get. It's 150 daily newspapers and 250 Sunday newspapers. It was the second largest paper route in all of Washington County. It took us two and a half hours to do that route on the weekdays. It took us about six hours on a Sunday morning. We started at midnight and finished before the sun came up. So if y'all, if anybody out there lived in East Tennessee in Fall Branch or, or, or um, Sulphur Springs or in the mid seventies, we probably, we were your delivery, your paper boys or paper people. And that's the kind of mama I had. She would do whatever it took to take care of her family. Now about that same time, things got really bad. My dad reached out for help and he joined Alcoholics Anonymous in 1976. And that began the journey of my mom, a, or my mom in Al-Anon and my father in AA. And they did tremendous work. They got sober, they lived a, a, a sober life. They lived a life of recovery. Um, I know there's one person out there specifically who would say that mom was his Al-Anon sponsor and my father was his AA sponsor. Uh, they gave a tremendous amount to the program. Uh, my older brother got sober in 1983. I got sober in 2003. There were four men in my family. Three of us are in recovery right now. Um, and tragically, in 2007, my younger brother died of the disease. Well, mom planned my younger brother's funeral. And in a weird sort of, well, it, it, it was her, her favorite song. One of her favorite songs was Ave Maria. And we had a uh, a professionally trained Broadway singer who had retired and come back to Virginia Beach to be part of our community. And she had an amazing voice and she sang a cappella version of the Ave Maria at my younger brother's funeral. Um, amazing Grace was another song that my mother loved. And, and they sang that in the middle part of the funeral. And then at the end, they sang my mom's favorite song. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he, Lord of the dance. It was a very beautiful funeral. Well, soon after the funeral, I was at my mom's house and she was on the phone talking to one of her Al-Anon people that she talked to a lot. And Helen telling them, she's telling Helen about the, the funeral service. She said, we started with the Ave Maria, it was beautiful. We had the, uh, the um, amazing grace in the middle and we had the Lord of the dance at the end. It was the most beautiful. She said that that funeral was to die for. Mom, can you please use another phrase to describe my younger brother's funeral, please? It was to die for, really? Well, that was in 2007. Um, uh, I don't have time to tell you all of this story because I went off to college. I quit being an engineer and went off to college and got a master's degree in, in storytelling at East Tennessee State University, one of the most amazing adventures of my life. And I can remember the day that I told mom that I was going to do that. She thought I had lost my mind. You're going to do what? You're going to quit? You're going to do what? Um, well, part of that program, you do a thing called My Finest Hour. And on February the 13th, Friday the 13th, as odd as that is, February the 13th, 13th of 2009, at the International Storytelling Center, me and a woman named Marjorie Schaefer, who it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, Marjorie, if you're listening. Uh, we put together a thing called Our Finest Hours. And it was a two-hour program. And my mom and dad and a lot of my family and friends got to come be a part of my audience that night. And after that show, mom just looked at me and she said, I had no idea the depth and the power of the work that you were doing. 
She said, obviously, you're where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. I'm very proud of you. She was always proud of us, brothers, <clears throat> nieces, nephews, everybody. Well, that was in February of 2009. We had no idea how sick she was then, but she went into the hospital on Good Friday of that same year. And um, she was she was real sick. We, we again, we didn't know how sick she was. Um, and we gathered there. We'd come back for Easter because, as I said, she was a, 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 a holiday nut. Um, we would gathered back together for that Easter celebration and she was in the hospital and we had decided she insisted, actually, that we go home and have that Easter dinner like we had planned. And so we were there at the hospital. We all gathered up. We went home. We had the Easter dinner. We came back. We were telling her all the stories about it. And she was just just reveling in all of the family stories. And I think this was her favorite moment when she realized, when we told her, said, yeah, everything went really well, mom, everything. We had, we had the ham, we had the sweet potato casserole, we had all the string beans casserole, we had all of that stuff, but dad forgot the rolls. He didn't even think about putting the rolls in the oven, so we didn't have any rolls for, for Easter dinner. And I know that she, somewhere in her head, she said, they missed me. It would have been, we would have had roles if I was there. And, and that, uh, that stuff meant a lot to her. So I'm, I'm glad she had that moment because she knew that it, it was different because she wasn't there. Well, I went back to East Tennessee, was finishing up my degree, uh, was going to finish up my degree. And um, they, we got a call to come back because she wasn't doing very well in the hospital. And we all gathered back on a Saturday and, uh, and she was unconscious and they had to do some surgery and the surgery didn't go well. They weren't able to fix what they needed to get in there and fix. And um, she was mostly unconscious. And we, uh, one of my uh, cousins had volunteered to stay that night at the hospital. So a lot of us had gone back home to, to get some sleep. And we came back on that Sunday morning and the doctor said, she had a bad night. What do you mean she had a bad night? I've had bad nights where I couldn't sleep. I had nightmares. What do you mean she had a bad night? Well, the fact of the matter was that all of the numbers in her uh, uh, vital signs that were supposed to be low were high, and all of the signs that were supposed to be high were low. And uh, there was no other decision to make than to to turn off the machines that were sustaining her life. And we knew we'd already had the conversation. She did not want to live that way. So we made the decision to do that. And I said, whoa, whoa, we haven't had the priest here yet. We can't do that. I asked, I asked the hospital administration, can we keep these machines going at least until we can get the priest here? And I said, absolutely, we can do that. So I called St. Nicholas Church. I talked to Jerry. Jerry said, you know, we can get the father over there, but it has to be after the nine o'clock mass because we don't have a whole lot of um, uh, uh, priests and what that told me was that he'd be rolling in about 10, 15 or 10, 20, and he'd have to hurry through the process because he had to be back at mass at 11 o'clock. So we made the arrangements. Uh, we had about an hour before that was going to happen. So each of us got to go and spend a few minutes with mom. I, I got to tell her how much I loved her and how much I appreciated all that she had done for us and how special she was to us. I got to apologize for not being the son that she deserved those times that I wasn't the son that she deserved. And I got to thank her for being the mom that, that everybody deserves. And um, we, we got, uh, so I went down and, and, and uh, Monsignor Barton did show up at about 1020 and I'm thinking he's got to hurry. And, and I was kind of rushing him through. He said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Um, why the rush? I said, well, I know that you've got to get back to mass for 11 o'clock mass. He said, oh, no, no, no. I said, the bishop is in town. The bishop is saying mass at 11 o'clock. And I thought, I told him, I said, are you telling me that mom has already orchestrated the bishop to pinch hint for you so that you can come say her last rites? He said, that's what I'm telling you. So we got back in that room and we gathered together and we all held hands and, and Monsignor did the last rites. And um, we, we were there when she passed and that was important to us. There was about 150 years of recovery between my dad, my older brother and dad's sponsor was there all gathered around that room. Um, and when we, when we had her uh, wake, um, we heard over and over and over again, these people that are in al saying, I just don't know who I will talk to now. I don't know who I'll speak to. This is just, I don't know who, will, who, who I can talk to now. My best friend is gone. 
Well, I brought bubbles to the wake and didn't really get to use them at the wake because things were going. So I, I figured we use them at mass somehow. I had asked uh, Father Barton, I said, can we use bubbles as we go into the mass? And he says, why don't you use them at the end of the mass? I said, oh, that's a better idea. I like that. So I gathered all of the grand nieces and grand nephews and grandkids, and we had all the bubbles ready. And as we started the ma- as, as we started the recession, dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. That was the recessional song. And as we were carrying mom's body out, me and the kids are up blowing this cloud of bubbles. And we left the church and we went into the beautiful vestibule and bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. And the family is following out family and friends. And we get out, we go underneath that covered walkway. It was a beautiful spring day. And we put her body, the pallbearers put her body in the cast and the hearse and they closed the door. There wasn't going to be a, a, a graveside service. And I turned and all of the families there with tears running down their cheeks and bubbles flying everywhere. And the hearse pulled away and my then tearing year old nephew looked up and said, grandmom would have said that was to die for. That's exactly what she would have said. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next teller is Jan Powers. It's really lovely to be with you all today. I'm glad it's fall. I'm glad it's no longer summer. Ooh, the Texas heat can really get you. I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, and it's not only hot, but it's really humid there. Now you may or you may not know that few of our Texas prisons are air conditioned. So think about that for a moment. No air conditioning. Some don't even have fans. And if they have big ceiling fans, well, sometimes the windows are always shut anyway. And in this particular time of COVID, they are to wear their masks all the time, those inmates, unless they're lying down in their bunks. Or well, I've heard that they could lie down on the floor too and take their mask off, but you wouldn't think you'd want to lie down on the floor. Perhaps it's cooler there. Uh, You may or may not know that my daughter is serving time in a Texas prison. You may not know that. You see, some, actually it was spring of 2016 when Amanda began her divorce proceedings, ending her 17 year marriage. I knew there had been problems and I wasn't watchful of all the signs and didn't know. But then as things went along, things went from bad to worse, I thought. Um, There were tellings of drugs being used. And while she had not been at my house for high school years, she'd lived with her dad and I knew there'd been drugs then. She'd had a boyfriend that she was going to plan to live with. And she did right out of high school. And and then he got his felony probation revoked and went off to prison November of that year. And then here in the midst of all of this, I hear, oh, he's back out after being in prison the second time. And I think, okay, we're all complicated people. I know this. So as things went along, and my world turned absolutely upside down, the rugs all pulled out from underneath me. Um, perhaps you are like I am, liking to have things in order, liking the stories you tell about family, having them all nice, or at least workable. Didn't seem workable to me. And then things went from bad to worse. Though I do have to say that in the midst of that, early on, she went to a, an outpatient um, there in Fort Worth for drugs. And I thought, I can go to Al-Anon. A friend had told me about Al-Anon. I'll go to Al-Anon. And then that way I can be a witness. I can be strong for her. 
Well, those of you who know about 12 step programs, um, my higher power certainly has a sense of humor because no, I was not there for her. That would not be the reason for me to be there. It would be for my own work, my own work. I'm a good spiritual person. And, oh, and then all the work I discovered I have to do. So you see, as, as time went on, I had that support and I had no idea how much I would need it because January 28th of 2018, I got a call on Sunday afternoon and it was Amanda and she was at the Hill County Jail and she's telling me about an accident that had happened the night before. And yes, she was still with this man who she had been in love with at 16. So the two of them had been in an accident, whereas the truck that got clipped turned over and over and over. And I'm told that the pictures of that truck look like there was a bomb that exploded it. And the woman passenger and that truck died. And Tony and Amanda, they spun out into the field and then they had left the scene of the accident. So, no, I did not bail her out. No, I did not hire a lawyer for her. She had that lawyer that the Hill County Jail provided and she was there. I had had enough grounding for myself in not enabling. I thought again, dear spirit, holy, 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 that you say bail. Oh, you're not to bail people out. And then it's like, oh. So then we, we can keep moving forward, you see. And um, she was in that Hill County Jail until a year later, having said she was the driver, that she passed two polygraph tests and then she was out last summer, not this summer, but the summer before. And then because of another technicality, she was back in the jail. And then by October, from July to October, she pled out. Now he's doing time too, but there she is. And I'm learning all kinds of things about prison. I'm learning that um, you might go to medical because you have a staph infection. And someone might look at you and say, don't you be wasting TDCJ time and resources and send you back and then send some ointment for you. And this is the case after she had already been three days at a hospital three months earlier, hooked up to IV. So I know that I can call and make calls and ask and ask. So I'm an advocate for her. Well, Things have happened, you see. If I take you back to the moment when she called me and how awful that was, how horrible to know that that woman had died that day, that night. And when I went to my computer to look and see what, what's about the accident and to read it and and to see pictures of Amanda and Tony. Criminals, they looked like criminals. And then I had to see how I held criminals. I've seen those pictures, you probably too at the post office. You've seen them in news reports, accidents that happen. Here are these people and criminals. My daughter, a criminal? And then I realized, oh, these criminals, hmm. Someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's brother, someone's sister, someone's mother, someone's father. And this whole business about leaving the scene, how could you leave the scene? And again, I had to, you know, she's my daughter. Maybe that's where it takes me to you never know. You never know what you would do. You can say what you would do. You never know. 
what you would do. That whole speaking about, you don't know until you've walked in someone else's shoes. Well, so this whole business about the other, those criminals, those people, those lawyers, those DAs, brings me to this tale. It's a story, it's a story that you can find um, in many books. There was even a version of it published in The Sun. That's a wonderful magazine, I think. And I wanna share it with you now. You see, there was this abbey. It had been there for, for hundreds of years. And in the reading, it talks about how beautiful the grounds were. And I'm sure there were the birds singing. When I talk about Beaumont, Texas, you know, there are those tall pines and the oaks. It was a wonderful place to grow up. I loved the squirrels, the sounds of the insects. So when I read about this abbey, I think, oh, it must have been a beautiful place. Gardens, I'm sure. The monks would tend the gardens and there would be flower gardens. I too have flower gardens. Such a gift nature is to me. Well, there were only five monks left. They were all over to the age of 70. And there, the abbot had begun to worry and wonder what's going to happen. You see, there had been many branch churches, but those had all closed down. So they went about what they always did with their praying and their meditating and tending the gardens and speaking with one another. But you see also, there on those grounds deep into the woods, there was a small hut, ha, small hut. And they knew that for many years, the rabbi from a local town had come there and used that little hut as a hermitage, quiet time. And because of their own prayers and meditation, they become a bit psychic knowing Oh, I think the rabbi's there. Nah, I'm sure he is. I, I can feel him. Don't, don't you think? Yes. And that's how it was from time to time when the rabbi would be there at the hut. Finally, the abbot had the idea, I should go and speak with the rabbi. I'm certain he could tell me something about what we do here. So our order does not just die out. And the next time, the very next time, when they began to say, oh, I think the rabbi's there. Yes, I think so. But the abbot went there from their home across those gardens, across the lawn into the woods. I like to think about that dappled light coming through, the bird song in his ear the smell of pines under his feet as he crunched the needles. And when he got to that little hut, he knocked on the door. The rabbi, oh, hello, hello, come in, come in. And the two spoke with one another. And the abbot said, what do I do? We are a dying order. What do you know? I don't know, I don't know. You know, the spirit seems to have left the people. I think we have few who come to our synagogue there in the town. So you see, they commiserated with one another. They spoke of deep things. They read the Torah. When it was time for the abbot to leave, they embraced. And the abbot stopped and said, wait, please, isn't there something? I cannot go back empty handed. Isn't there something you can tell me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yes, yes. I. One of you is the Messiah. Oh, okay. And then he went back all the way thinking. And when he got there and the monk said, so what do you know? What do you know? Uh, well, he didn't have an answer except this. He told me this. He said, one of us is the Messiah. Well, they looked at one another. You can imagine the Messiah, one of us. 
And they began to question over the next days, sometimes with one another, sometimes to themselves, hmm, it must be the abbot. Yes, yes. He would be the one because he's tended to so many. Uh, their spiritual needs over the decades. He has, yes, yes, the abbot, the Messiah. Hmm, well, maybe not. Maybe it's brother Thomas. He's a learned man. Yes, yes, he knows a lot. Hmm. Couldn't be Brother Elrod. <laughs> he's so cranky. He is cranky. He thinks he's right all the time. But you know what? He is right all the time. Well, yes. Couldn't be Brother Philip. No, no, he's a nobody. He's so passive. Except, you know, right when you need something, well, there he is. And he's got what you need. Maybe it's Brother Phil. And then me? Couldn't be me. No, not me. How could it be me? I'm ordinary. Oh, God, surely it's not me. But then I have to tell you, they began to treat each other with extraordinary respect, extraordinary kindness, because they wondered which one of them was the Messiah now, you may be thinking, oh, Jesus, which one is Jesus come back? Or you might also be thinking of the term of Messiah with a little M going, who's the leader here? Who's the leader that will take up the cause that we need now? Who? Which one among us? Do you know that that aura of respect and kindness so permeated that abbey and permeated the grounds that those people who would come from the towns to have a little picnic, they... <gasps> This is a wonderful place. And soon they were uh, inviting other friends to come and they would picnic. And then young men came and they began to have conversations with the monks. And soon someone said, I, I want to be a monk. How can I do that? And then, do you know, the order began to grow. Yes. Extraordinary kindness, extraordinary respect. I, through this whole process of discovering criminals. My daughter, a criminal, well, she's incarcerated. And if you read why she's there, you go, yeah, criminal. She's also my daughter. So I then began to wonder, well, where else do I have biases? And oh, don't they show up? They do. But with my work, you see, that I've been doing, that all through this time of horror, I've been supported. It might come from words from a friend. It might come from sitting in an Al-Anon meeting. It might come from hearing about someone who has befriended Amanda. So even though I know that our taxpayers and me and our money, well, there's a broken system there it's paying for in our prisons. I know that. But I also knew that when they said, okay, we got this big infection and you need to stay home, I thought, oh, there's going to be some horror in this. But I also know that there will be opportunities here that we wouldn't have had without this. So too, I can look at my own life now and see. And there is such beauty, such beauty that spirit gives us, the divine life, God that we are supported and loved, that I am grateful for this day and all of you here. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Our last teller for this morning is David Titus. Good morning. Stories are so important. And the first professional storyteller I heard was 1964. I had taken a job in a library and they were having a, a storytelling workshop. Eulalie Steinmetz Ross. She was a little old lady with kind of a scratchy voice and she was telling us how to tell a story and all I thought was, oh, another who was when, another has been. And, and then she said, 
Long ago and far away across the seven seas, there lived a poor old woman and she had a little rooster. Every day that little rooster would go out in the road looking for worms and bugs. And there were worms and bugs in his yard, but they were his friends. And no matter how hungry you are, you can't eat your friends, can you? So he was in the road, scratching around, and all of a sudden, up twinkled a diamond button. The little rooster looked at the diamond button, and the diamond button twinkled and seemed to say, take me home to your mistress, the old woman. She likes diamond buttons. So the little rooster picked up the diamond button and started home with it. But just then, along came a great, huge Turkish sultan. And he had three servants helping to carry the baggy, baggy pantaloons on his baggy Turkish trousers. And the little rooster, the Turkish sultan, looked at the little rooster and at the diamond button. And he said, little rooster, give me your diamond button. No, the old woman, I'm taking it home to my mistress, the old woman. She likes diamond buttons. Well, the Turkish sultan liked diamond buttons, too. And he, and he would not take no for an answer. So, again, he said, Turkish, little rooster, give me your diamond button. No. The Turkish sultan called to his three servants. I have no idea. And he said, servants, seize the little rooster and take the diamond button away from him. The three servants seized the little rooster and took the diamond button away from him. And they took it back to the palace and they put it in the treasure room with all the other gold and jewels. Now the little rooster was angry and the little rooster flew to the palace. He flew up to the window and he looked in and he said, Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkish Sultan just ignored the little rooster and went into the next room. Again, the Turkish Sultan or the little rooster flew to the next window and again he said, Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. Now, the Turkish Sultan was getting angry and he called to his three servants and he said, servants, seize that little rooster and throw him down in the well that he might drown in all that water. And the three servants seized the little rooster took him to the well, threw him down in the well that he might drown in all that water. The little rooster just looked at all the water and he said, oh, come my empty stomach, swallow all the water in the well. And his empty stomach swallowed all the water in the well. And then he flew back to the windowsill and again, Cock a doodle doo! Turkish Sultan, give me back my diamond button. Now the Turkish Sultan was getting angry, very angry, and he called to his three servants and he said, Servants, seize that little rooster and throw him in the fire that he might roast to death. And the three servants seized the little rooster and threw him in the fire that he might roast to death. But the little rooster just looked around and looked around and said, oh, come my full stomach, give out all the water and put out all the fire. And his full stomach, give out all the water and put out all the fire. And then, he flew back to that window, and again, 
cock and doodle do? Turkey Sultan, give me back my diamond button. The Turkey Sultan was livid. And he called to his three servants and he said, Servants, seize that little rooster and throw him in the beehive that he might be stung to death. The three servants seized the little rooster and threw him in the beehive that he might be stung to death. The little rooster looked around and looked around, said, oh, come, my empty stomach, swallow all the bees. And his empty stomach swallowed all those bees. And he flew back and again. Give me back my diamond button. And the turkey sultan was so angry he couldn't even speak. Finally, he said, Servant, seize that little rooster and bring him to me. And he said, Servants, what fate worse than death can I give to this little rooster? And the first servant said, oh, Sahib, because that's what you call a Turkish sultan. Oh, Sahib, why don't you chop off his head? No, no, said the Turkish sultan. I know, Sahib, why don't you hang him from the flagpole? No, no, I know, Sahib. Why don't you sit on him? Sit on him and squash him flat. That's it. That's what I'll do. I'll sit on him. And he took the little rooster. Well, he spread the baggy, baggy pantaloons on his baggy Turkish trousers, put the little rooster on his throne, and he proceeded to sit on the little rooster. But the little rooster just looked around and looked around and said, oh, come my false stomach, give out all the bees that they might sting the Turkish Sultan. And do you think they did? Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> Servants, take this little rooster, take him to my treasure room and tell him to get his calm found a diamond button on leave. And the three servants took the little rooster. They took him to the treasure room and they told him to get his confounded diamond button and leave. And then they left. And the little rooster, the little rooster picked up the diamond button. And then he looked around at all the gold and treasure. Oh, come, my empty stomach, swallow all the gold and treasure. And it swallowed all the gold and treasure. And then he waddled home as fast as his full little stomach would let him go. And when he arrived home, he said, oh, come, my full stomach, give out all the gold and treasure that the poor old woman might be rich. And it did. And she was. And then the little rooster took, went out in the yard to tell all of his friends about his adventures with the Turkish Sultan and the diamond button. You see, that was the first story I ever heard from a storyteller. I didn't hear her voice, I heard the story. And two days later, I was to tell a story, and I told that story exactly the way she told it, because it just went into my soul. That story is found in a book called The Good Master by Kate Sarady. 
Diamonds are important. Jewels are important. My grandmother at Christmas time always had Christmas Eve dinner and we had roast goose. We had plum pudding. She was a teetotaler, so she asked my mother to make the hard sauce because mom had a good recipe. Mom also had a, bad, a bottle of brandy. But at Christmas, one of the last years that we had grandma, she came and we were gathered around ready to open the gifts and she says, well, first, I have a little thing that I'd like to give away. She said, I'm getting old and I'm not able to keep all of my things and I'd like to give some things away. And oh, no, Grandma, oh, Mimi, you're going to live forever. No, no, I want to give away. I think I'll give away my diamond pin. And, oh, well. Gee, and yes, I, 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 I made strips of paper so that maybe my daughters and daughters-in-law, because they're as important as my daughters, they could, they could do how uh, find it. And no, Grandma, no, you, you need. Well, why don't you have the granddaughters? Because we have things. Have the granddaughters draw and. She said, well, granddaughters-in-law also. So, so she told them that they could, they could try. And they all wrote their names and they put their, their, their papers in a hat because in those days there were always men's hats around it. And Jamie collected them and, and he pulled out one of the names and everybody's waiting. And, and, and my grandmother said, oh, oh, it's one of my granddaughters in law. And they're all looking, the granddaughters are going, oh. and she said, Becky Titus, my wife, my wife. And Becky went, oh, <laughs> oh, thank you, grandmother, thank you. And she went over and grandmother gave her the box from Cleaver's Jewelry Store with her diamond pin and Becky Titus opened the box and, and do you remember the Nixon years with expletive deleteds? Well, my wife said an expletive deleted at grandmother's house on Christmas Eve because here's my grandmother's dime and pin. Sometimes a story is never what a story is about. One more story about a man who was a poor farmer and he had no money, he had one cow, too many children, and he was angry at his wife all the time. The children were noisy. His father in law would come over and tell him how to prune the trees, peach trees, and, and he would resent his brother who had a fine farm, and, and, and life was miserable for him. And one day he was sitting at the table and he just could not take it anymore. And he left the farm went into the forest, went up the mountain, up to the wise man of the mountain. And the wise man of the mountain was sitting there and, and the farmer came and he said, yes. And, and the wise man of the mountain said, what brings you here? And the man said, well, I'm, I'm, angry at my wife, I'm jealous of my, my, my neighbors, I'm resentful of my brother. He said, I'm, I'm a miserable man. I don't know what to do about it. And the wise man of the mountain said, it is not good for a man to be angry and resentful and jealous. And the wise man of the mountain got up and went into his, his cave and he came back out and he said, here, maybe this can help you. And he gave the farmer a ruby of great value, a beautiful ruby. And the farmer said, oh, 
and the farmer took it in and up at the light, the light shone through it and twinkled and, and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He backed away thanking the wise man and he started down the mountain and, and, and the sun shone and when he went under a tree, it was dark and then it shone again and as he walked along, Oh, he thought of the things he could get. He got down to his farm and he sat down at the table and, and the light shone through the candle and then, then the candle gutted and but the fire still had a coal or two that was there was a warm glow and and he held that until until morning. Morning when the sun came in and sparkled through that ruby. He, the farmer got up. He walked across his farm into the forest and up the mountainside to the wise man of the mountain. And the wise man of the mountain was sitting and he said, Come, what brings you, my son? And the, the farmer said, Here, would you take this back, please? And the wise man said, don't you want that? And the farmer said, no, I want what you have that you could give that away so easily. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now, for all of our participants who have been at Sacred Tales before, um, you know that we normally have a passing of the basket afterwards, and, well, we can't do that today. But we sort of can. I want you to imagine a basket in front of you now being handed from panel to panel to panel. And in that basket is a slip of paper. And I want you to pull that slip of paper out and read it because what it says is, all we ask you to do is to do a kindness for someone else. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Just do a kindness for someone else. I'd like to thank our tellers today, Jay Staley, Valerie Kimball, David Clanch, Jan Powers, and David Titus. And I also want to give a great big thank you to Brooks Myers. Brooks just came on the board a couple of months ago, not knowing that he was not only going to have this conference put on his shoulders or dropped in his lap, but he has so patiently worked with an entire organization of left-brained or right-brained people. <laughs> And we all owe him a debt of gratitude because I don't think this would have ever happened without him, and especially not as beautifully put together as it is. So thank you, Tellers. Thank you, Brooks Myers. And thank you, audience, for being here because we wouldn't have this without you. And we'll see you at the next concert, which will be at 1 o'clock, and it will be the children's concert. Bye.